I'm Brian Carpenter, host of Fresh Air at Five, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Phil Zalazo, PhD. He is the co-founder of Reflective Sciences. And we're talking about the importance of understanding and building executive function skills in children. What a cool conversation. So much to learn. You're going to love this. Thanks for listening. And by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and uh, left a review. Could you do that for me? You know, say a few nice words and how about five stars? Mm, you know, the other way you could do it is by, you know, going to Podbean or, or, or going to Apple or, or iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify, and uh, leaving a review there so you could do that too. That'd be so cool. Thanks so much. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. Reflection Sciences is the culmination of 20 years of groundbreaking research and unwavering passion for executive function. Phil Zalazo, Ph.D., and Stephanie Carlson, Ph.D., researchers at the University of Minnesota and co-founders of Reflection Sciences, spent years studying executive function and determining how it could be improved and how that, in turn, could improve early childhood education. They soon realized a key component was missing, an effective way to scientifically and objectively measure executive function in young children. With a growing appreciation of the need for services around executive function and with support from the National Institutes of Health, the co-founders created the best measure of executive function available today, a direct behavioral assessment of the neurocognitive skills that are most vital to academic and life success. After seeing the effectiveness of the assessment in their own research, Dr. Carlson and Dr. Zalazo created Reflection Sciences in 2014 to bring it to the broader educational community. Our assessment and related products are now being used around the world to accurately measure executive function in preschools, K-12 schools, after-school programs, Head Start programs, pediatric clinics, and research universities. Phil Zalazo, Ph.D., is the co-founder of Reflection Sciences and a Nancy M. and John E. Lindahl professor at the Institute of Child Development, University of Minnesota. He was formerly a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto. Uh, Phil, welcome and thanks for joining me. Say hi to everyone. Uh, Hello. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Well, glad to have you, Phil. And uh, all right, let's start off just right at right off the top. Sure. What's Reflection Sciences and can you provide a bit of a background? Yes. Reflection Sciences is a company that, as you mentioned, Stephanie Carlson and I co-founded. And we we did so for a number of reasons. Generally, the idea was to uh, leverage the science around executive function skills for uh, public good, and in particular, to uh, help parents and teachers and and other adults support the healthy development of these skills in in young children. Um, A uh, proximate, proximal motivation for us was that in our research, we had developed uh, an assessment of executive function skills, and um, it had uh, gained wide traction in the research uh, market. Um, And we had people calling us up all the time for, you know, can we have a copy of this and so forth. And so we realized that the, the demand uh, for ways to measure executive function skills and how to promote them and so forth was, uh, was widespread. And we came to the conclusion that we knew much more, uh, on the basis of research about how to measure and, and improve executive function skills than uh, was widely known. <clears throat> and so we wanted to close that gap between basic science and uh, products and policies and tools that could actually be beneficial to society. Very cool. Uh, and so now, now that you've told us about reflection sciences, what I need you to do is, you know, Tell me a bit about what you do at the University of Minnesota, as well as your role at Reflection Sciences. Go, can you go there? Sure. I'm, I'm a professor um, <clears throat> and I conduct research on executive function skills and their development. And 
uh, the neural correlates, the brain bases of executive function skills. A lot of our focus these days has been on intervention, on developing ways to uh, to facilitate uh, the development of these skills. And <clears throat> that's important because these skills, executive function skills, are excellent predictors of uh school readiness, school success, even uh, long-term outcomes into adulthood, physical and mental health, uh, job success, socioeconomic status, and, and the like. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, we know how to cultivate these skills. They don't simply grow. They're skills that, that are acquired um, uh, through experience. And, and particular types of experience are especially uh, important in helping to build these skills. And, and what the research increasingly has shown is that uh, these skills are even more important than um, traditional indicators of uh, developmental outcomes like IQ scores. And so it turns out it's, it's not so much what you know that matters. It's uh, whether you have these attention regulation skills that allow you to use what you know in order to accomplish your goals. And I could say a little bit more uh, <clears throat> about executive function skills, what they are, and, and how we conceptualize them, if you'd like. Please, that'd be awesome. Sure. Uh, so executive function skills, as I mentioned, are a set of attention regulation skills. They're ways of using attention intentionally in order to focus on the right thing at the right moment. And we can use our attention intentionally um, to, for example, be flexible in our attention, to shift our focus so that we can look at a problem from different points of view, so that we can take somebody else's perspective, for example, on a situation. And we can uh, use our attention intentionally to be selective, to ignore potentially distracting information that might lead to impulsive or reflexive responding um, so we can stay focused on, on, on our goals. And we can uh, use our attention to sustain information in mind over time. And so executive function skills are often measured as cognitive flexibility, shifting your attention one way or the other, uh, uh, <clears throat> inhibitory control, being able to focus your attention and ignore distractions, and uh, so-called working memory, being able to keep information in mind so that you can use it in a goal-directed way over time to, to solve problems and, and uh, achieve your, your aims. Very cool. You know, so so my, my audience is uh, primarily uh, uh, educators of all sorts and, mm -hmm. uh, and building administrators as well. Um, so, so let's talk about, you know, why do they need to know about these skills? I mean, because obviously that's where we're going with reflection sciences, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's, a, you know, let, let's go there for a minute. Why, why do they sure. know in that classroom? Need to know. Well, they need to know because, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, these are excellent predictors of uh, school performance. So even more so than IQ, they predict whether uh, children will uh, succeed in kindergarten. They predict how much children will learn from their kindergarten experience. So they are a foundation for learning. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's true for learning math and for learning reading and, and indeed everything else. What teachers um, historically have neglected to do is to teach these foundational learning skills to children. It's been assumed that uh, children, by the time they enter kindergarten and beyond, that they have already developed these skills sufficiently in order to be able to succeed in a, in a classroom setting. But many children, uh, it turns out, um, don't have these skills. And there are socioeconomic status and racial disparities in uh, academic achievement that are well-known, so-called achievement gaps. We believe that to some uh, extent, these achievement gaps in academic performance are actually uh, executive function gaps. And the research increasingly bears this out, that the relation between, for example, socioeconomic status and school performance is mediated to a considerable extent by 
uh, children's executive function skills. And um, you can imagine that children growing up in very difficult circumstances, circumstances of poverty and facing systemic racism and what have you, that uh, it's harder for parents to provide those children under those circumstances with opportunities to uh, to acquire these these fundamental executive function skills that are so important for learning and school success. And uh, and so our research has really been focused on how do these skills normally develop? And it turns out they don't simply grow just as our brain doesn't simply grow. Rather, uh, these skills um, get developed as a function of practice, as a function of use. We, we say that you learn these skills like any skill by doing. <clears throat> when you uh, practice these skills in some simple way, uh, you activate relevant networks in the brain, and increasingly we were able to pinpoint where those networks are, what parts of the brain are involved. And, and when those networks in the brain get activated, they adapt, they change, they become more efficient, they become easier to invoke and use in the future. And so, in other words, the brain changes as a function of experience. And I like to say that uh, our brains don't simply grow, rather we grow our brains, and we grow our brains in particular ways by using them in particular ways. And and in particular, children um, <clears throat> benefit from opportunities to practice their developing executive function skills. And uh, adults can help children do that by uh, ensuring that they face challenges that are manageable. So they're not so easy that they don't have to stretch a little and grow their skills, uh, but they're also not so hard that children get overwhelmed and just give up. And so parents can, can and teachers for that matter, can be autonomy supportive, so to speak, when it comes to cultivating children's executive function skills, helping children find meaningful challenges, meaningful choices, and exercise their uh, executive function skills by making choices, by solving relatively simple problems. And as they do that, they, they uh, improve these skills, they rewire their neural networks in the brain, and they also um, acquire a sense of themselves as uh, as potential problem solvers, as people who are efficacious, people who can can have a, a goal and uh, and achieve it, and so have have some uh, ambition and actually put it into practice. That, that's awesome. So, so let me just to, to to make sure I understand. So, are these physical skills like the ability to um, take objects and uh, figure out what to do with the object or are they kind of like thinking skills also like the idea to, that you, you can create a process for solving something or a, a skill, or is it like a, a, a skill that's like associated with, you know, because adults listen to you that you might talk with them or um, you might be willing to share your ideas and thoughts because at home, maybe your parents practice the idea of involving you in the conversations and actually talking with you. Are, are they some of those types of things? That's a really good point. We take a, a comprehensive approach to the cultivation of these skills, and we try to consider not just the practice of the skills themselves, but strategies that facilitate the use of those skills. And so you asked what kinds of skills are these? Well, fundamentally, they're attention regulation skills. So um, as I say, being able to restrict your attention to focus on one thing and to stay focused on it. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that those kinds of attention regulation skills are just like any other skill, like a physical skill. And you acquire them in the same way by practice um, and through repetition and through increasing challenges. Um, but there are... Um, other considerations. So these skills don't um, exist in, in a vacuum, um, but they, they also depend on things like if children, for example, are too stressed, stress interferes with uh, 
executive function skills. Um, you know, stress tends to hijack your attention. You focus on whatever it is you're worried about, and then it becomes hard to uh, regulate your attention in the in the context of problem solving. And so being able to be aware of stress and have some strategies for managing it, uh, that's, that's also important. Having some um, beliefs about yourself, like I'm a capable person and uh, I can actually improve my skills uh, through practice and effort, that also helps. Um, and so, as I say, we take a, a kind of comprehensive approach to look at the whole child and the whole context. Um, but fundamentally, these are attention regulation skills. One, one other thing I should mention is that, uh, and this is reflected in the name, Reflection Sciences, um, executive function skills depend importantly on um, <clears throat> what we call reflection. And, and by that, what we mean is, in order to um, engage your attention regulation skills in the context of problem solving, you have to first recognize that you have a problem. You have to notice. Usually in life, we can get by uh, quite well um, on what you might call autopilot for a lot of things, right? We're used to driving and, you know, whatever. And so we can do that without paying too much attention to our actual driving. We could be listening to the radio or having a conversation with somebody and we kind of drive, you know, fairly automatically. And we do that until we encounter a problem and somebody swerves and pulls in front of us. And then we, we recognize that problem and we engage in uh, what we call reflection. We, we pause and we step back and we say, all right, I need to get serious about this. I need to, to approach this intentionally. I need to think about what I'm doing. And so by reflection, what we mean is pausing, thinking twice before responding, uh, taking the context into consideration. And then also, as you take efforts to solve whatever problem you've encountered, you have to continue to monitor your progress towards your goal. And so a good deal of effectively using executive function skills is being able to be sufficiently self-aware to reflect on when uh, it's important to do so. And so when we cultivate executive function skills in children, we don't only provide them with opportunities to practice using those skills, which does improve those skills, but we also... Um, encourage children to reflect on what it is they're learning and what that's good for and how they can use it in different situations, how they could use that, for example, when learning math or when reading. Uh, you know, I mentioned working memory, keeping information in mind. When you, you know, read a sentence or you read a paragraph, you have to uh, understand the end of the paragraph in light of what you read at the beginning of the paragraph. So you have to keep that information in mind and, and integrate it. And, and that depends importantly on, on executive function skills. Awesome. I appreciate you explaining that. It's, it's a, uh, there's um, so much that you think about that a, a child, uh, I mean, what they're can be exposed to or not exposed to that could influence what they can do down the road. And, and mm -hmm. uh, it's so important. And, and so that brings me to my next question, which is why should parents care about this information as well? Because I would think that they're another audience right there. Indeed, they're another audience. Um, well, I, parents obviously care about their children's uh, success in, in life and school. And, um, and these skills, there's quite a bit of research showing that children with better executive function skills in, in preschool um, show higher levels of what's called school readiness. They're, they're better adapted to uh, succeed in a school setting. So there's that. Um, but also, uh, executive function skills are fundamentally important not only for learning in a classroom setting, but also for managing uh, emotional reactions and, and behavior. And indeed, um, <clears throat> difficulties with executive function skills uh, can put children at risk for a wide range of uh, clinical conditions. Um, so executive function skills are what we sometimes call transdiagnostic indicators 
of mental health challenges. So ADHD, autism, conduct disorder, emotional behavioral difficulties, all these things are different from one another, but they do have in common that they're characterized by difficulties with executive function skills. So executive function challenges are kind of a, a common denominator across a wide range of, of behavior problems. You need them, for example, in order to manage your emotions. You need them in order to uh, delay gratification, to, to work for the long-term goal and, and avoid immediate distractions. And that plays out uh, in, in every aspect of, of our life. And so, uh, so parents um, can support their children's healthy adaptation, generally speaking, uh, by uh, supporting the development of executive function skills, by teaching children not just the content that they need to know, like prepping them about how to read and write and do arithmetic and so forth, as, as teachers will, um, but by teaching them fundamentally how to learn those things more effectively and more efficiently and how to manage their behavior in a way that allows them to learn those things uh, and not be distracted by literally other kids whispering in your ear in a classroom or, um, you know, the frustration that leads to a fight on the playground and suspension and, and all those kinds of things that interfere not just with with learning, but uh, more broadly with uh, healthy development. Gotcha. You know, and it's, it's funny. So having observed a lot of, especially uh, throughout my years, all levels of uh, class, the, uh, uh, when a teacher's working in the, in the kindergarten levels, a lot of times they'll have mm -hmm. kindergarten to like first grade. A lot of times they'll have like a carpet at some place there and, and you'll see that used as a way to transition kids. And I think it's, it's cool what you're talking about because a kid who doesn't understand kind of sticks out when, when they try to teach them that this is the place where I talk to you, give you instructions, and then we transition over to the tables where I have you know, mm -hmm. these work areas or I have these areas where you're able to focus on whatever it is. Maybe it's a reading area. Maybe it's a, a small group area where they actually you know, make something or do something. And, and maybe mm -hmm. this other area is a place where they work on uh, this activity while they're listening to uh, an explanation on headphones. Um, I, I would think that a kid who struggles in that struggles with trying to even just translate you know, going from one thing to another and how you do it is, is, am I on the right track there? I think you are. I think, uh, executive function skills are really important for transitions. Um, and for, um, you mentioned sitting on the carpet and it's a different, uh, context in which you can, um, pause and reflect and prepare for what you're about to do next and so forth. And that's very much like the practice of reflection. Um, thinking twice before you respond as opposed to just rushing into it. When you just rush into situations, you're more likely to be um, uh, distracted and have your attention captured by um, aspects of the situation that may be really salient but ultimately aren't important for your longer-term goals. And so having a little bit of time beforehand to pause and reflect and think about what do I really want to accomplish here and what are the features of this situation that I really need to pay attention to and um, and so that's very much um, the approach that we take it's it's analogous to what you described with the carpet um, and <clears throat> as with any skill uh, you know these things might have to be very drawn out and very explicit, like there's literally a carpet upon which you sit where these instructions are, are delivered. Um, but as you practice that over and over again, you get to the point where you can do it so automatically, you don't even hardly have to think about it anymore. And so people get very proficient at engaging in reflection and pausing and thinking twice to the point where they don't even realize that they're doing it. That. You know, it's excellent because you see that happen. You see them, as, as the longer the kids do it, eventually, even the ones who struggle with in the beginning, you know, they get the mm -hmm. point. And at some at some point, they're they're able to demonstrate, which is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool stuff. So Reflection Science is uh, Minnesota Executive Function Scale. The MEFS yes. is the first and normed measure of executive function skills. So what's the significance of this? And 
we're going to, I'm going to kind of ask you to go into some thoughts about uh, how it's done and stuff like this. So sure. Absolutely. So we, we call this the MEFS, the Minnesota executive function scale. Um, and uh, this um, is a, a measure of uh, all aspects of executive function. Um, it requires uh, children and indeed adults uh, for that matter. This is a measure that can be used across the lifespan. And it, um, it requires uh, children or adults to keep information in mind um, and uh, uh, focus on it and also to be flexible shifting from some instructions to other instructions. So let me give you an example. In this task, children uh, or adults are shown target cards like a, a red uh, rabbit and a blue boat, for example. And then they're given these test cards. In this example, it would be uh, instead of a blue boat, the target card, a red boat. And so you could match that red boat, for example, to the red flower by virtue of color, or you could match it to the blue boat because they're both boats by virtue of shape. And that sounds really simple. And indeed it is. But even for adults, to be able to switch from trial to trial as a function of the instructions, when you're told to sort by shape and then you're told to switch and short, sort by color and then back to shape and so forth, it's, it's quite challenging. And kids often, and adults too sometimes, uh, make mistakes. Uh, but they also um, will slow down in order to uh, to be accurate, in order to sort correctly. And so you can get an, a measure of how efficiently um, people can follow these instructions, behave in a goal-directed way, uh, switch from sorting by shape to sorting by color um, by looking at how much they need to slow down in order to get it correct. And, um, and so we've been able to um, put this into an app. Uh, there's, this is a widely used uh, measure in, in the scientific research community. Um, <clears throat> But uh, what we've done is created a, a, an, a convenient app for school use and home use and, and so forth. Um, and it's presented in a, in a game-like setting. Um, and children uh, choose an avatar and proceed through various levels of difficulty and so forth. And uh, we've also been able to um, collect uh, normative data from over uh, 53,000 uh, kids and adults in the United States. And so we have a lot of information to help us contextualize any particular child's performance. So how does this child do relative to other children that child's age? How about relative to girls that child's age? How about relative to uh, children in independent schools at that age? And so on and so forth. And so um, so that gives us quite a bit of diagnostic, so to speak, information about um, how uh, children's executive function skills are, are, are developing. And uh, being able to measure those skills is really important if you're interested in promoting their healthy development because you have a, a baseline, you can understand where this child is, and, and that gives you information about what kinds of experiences do they need in order to help them move up to the next level. And what we've found in, in our research is that uh, we know how to, uh, to train these executive function skills. We've in published research in our lab, we've brought children into the laboratory and we've given them this measure of executive function skills and then we gave them brief training and, uh, and then we readministered uh, the assessment of executive function, and we were able to show considerable uh, improvements compared to control conditions. We also found that uh, that not only did those kids do better on the uh, executive function tasks they were trained on, um, but they did better on other assessments as well, including uh, a measure of flexible perspective taking. So it looked totally different from 
um, the way they were trained, um, but they were able to be flexible in thinking about what somebody else would think in a situation when, when that person would think differently than they do. And we also measured in that same study uh, children's brain activity, both before training and after training, and were able to document the corresponding changes in, in neural activity. So uh, we call these skills neurocognitive skills sometimes. And by that, we mean that, yeah, they're cognitive skills, they're attention regulation skills, but increasingly we know with some precision exactly what networks in the brain tend to uh, subserve these skills. So one of the things that I heard you say is that you have this app. Mm -hmm. And so is, is it administered or is it that, you know, you – you would instruct like a teacher or a parent to have their child take it. And then based upon what they do and playing with the app um, and going through the motions of doing what it's asking you to do, um, mm -hmm. is it, is it just then it interprets it or puts it into a chart or graph or gives back feedback to the, the person that uh, takes a look at it. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah. Good question. So with young children um, it's typically administered uh, by an adult uh, who sits alongside the child and um, might read the instructions to the child. Uh, the, the instructions are presented on, on the monitor. Um, but uh, for a young child, there needs to be a little bit of supervision. Um, beyond a certain age, um, children can uh, self-administer um, and read the instructions themselves. Um, and uh, uh, it's a computer-adaptive game-like assessment. And so, in other words, uh, depending on how the child responds, if they make mistakes at a particular level of difficulty, then the app will give them uh, a lower level of difficulty and see if they succeed at that lower level. Or if they breeze through it quickly, then the app will keep presenting more challenging uh, uh, measures. And, um, and so this allows us to figure out pretty quickly you know, what is the highest level of skill that this child can display? And that then, uh, relative to our norms, allows us to show uh, on a graph, you know, here's the normal distribution of performance um, in children at this particular age, and this child just scored right there, you know, they're in 70th percentile or something relative to their peers. Gotcha. So th that's cool the way the way that works. And, and by the way, I in this world that we're in today, talk about making it easier to be able to get a child to help participate in it, um, as opposed to the the ways <laughs> that we've had in the past of just a pencil and uh, um, filling out uh, answering questions or drawing something or something like this. They actually get to inter uh, interact with it. I think that's cool. That's it, right. Yeah, it's much more engaging. I would think so. The, all right. So uh, how will executive function skills impact our understanding of child development and, you know, and the education space in the coming years? I mean, where, where's it going? I mean, where's the, how's it growing? Well, I, we've witnessed uh, over the past couple of decades um, enormous progress in scientific literature um, in terms of our understanding of these skills and how they develop and how to cultivate them and so forth. Um, but there's a lag, uh, to be sure, um, and uh, teachers uh, are increasingly learning about these skills in their own uh, education and, uh, and in the broader public discussion around these skills. Um, and uh, my feeling is that we are headed uh, fairly rapidly towards a kind of um, broader breakthrough uh, in terms of public awareness of, of the fundamental importance of these skills. The, the research is just so strong and, um, and, uh, and, and increasingly it's getting out there. And, um, and on the basis of that research, where do I think uh, we should go? I think uh, teachers uh, need to have a broader um, understanding of their um, pedagogical mandate, so to speak. So rather than just trying to teach kids how to read, write, and do arithmetic, I think we're going to see preschool teachers, uh, teachers in the early school grades, and indeed even 
uh, in middle school and high school, paying more attention to executive function skills, how uh, executive function skills can uh, undermine learning. And so it's not just that a child uh, is unintelligent or is necessarily unmotivated to learn or something like that, but rather is struggling with the executive function challenges that are built into any, any problem, uh, any, any lesson. And so being mindful uh, of those challenges, I think, can particularly help uh, children who might struggle uh, to succeed in school. Children, for example, with ADHD or, or even just children who've not had opportunities to really practice and develop these skills. Um, but particularly in the early uh, years, I think we're going to see teachers who put more time into actually cultivating these skills in, in the preschool or uh, school classroom. Um, and the, the, the payoff, the potential payoff is, is clear. If you can help children acquire the skills that they need in order to learn efficiently, it's going to be a lot easier to then turn around and teach them how to read and write and do all the other things. And so um, I, I believe it really ought to be a, because they're fundamental to learning and adaptation, it ought to be a priority to ensure that all children uh, have these, these fundamental executive function skills. And as I say, this is especially important for, for kids who might struggle, uh, whether you know, because of a neurological condition uh, or because of um, you know, poverty or whatever, right? Um, uh, and so it, you can think of building executive function skills as a way of, in, in young children, as a way of really leveling the playing field so that all children at least have the potential to be able to learn and succeed in, uh, in learning math and reading and so forth. Oh, that's excellent. So, so tell me why, I mean, let's, it's like a little commercial right now. I mean, why, why, why should teachers, educators learn to use, uh, um, and you call it MEFS app? Mm -hmm. MEFS, MEFS. Well, uh, because it's effective and it's easy to administer and uh, it will greatly facilitate their efforts to teach uh, the typical curriculum. Um, and so uh, this can be used in a classroom setting to gauge, um, for example, does a child uh, struggle with executive function skills and might that be misinterpreted if you didn't know that might that be misinterpreted as oh this child doesn't like school or they have a bad attitude or you know they're really not all that swift and um, and so then um, knowing about uh, the individual differences among one's students with respect to executive function skills one can um, make appropriate accommodations, um, can scaffold uh, the uh, education, the, sorry, the executive function demands of certain assignments for some children. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and help them indeed continue to acquire those skills. So I mentioned before about how adults, teachers, and, and parents um, can help children grow these skills by, by, helping children um, to face uh, appropriate challenges. So, um, you know, if your goal is to, uh, to teach a math lesson and children, uh, you know, are perfectly competent at math, but they're struggling with being distracted and thinking about recess or something, or they're still ruminating about some insult that some other child made or something like that, um, you know, if, if you ignore that, then you're just going to um, fail to to effectively teach the lesson. But if you pay attention to it, you can say, all right, well, what can we do? You know, we can uh, help this child pause and reflect and reframe the situation and put it in the past and say, OK, now I'm going to focus on math. I'll forget about that. You know, we'll talk through it or something like that. So it provides a, a whole other uh, source of, of important information. And as I say, it's information about a skill and a set of skills that uh, actually end up being more 
determinative of uh, children's learning and school success than the usual suspects. Then is the child smart or not? Right, that's the first place a lot of people go. Or does is the child motivated and engaged or not? That's another place. But a child might be motivated and uh, smart and uh, struggle with being distracted uh, or forgetting, failing to keep things in mind. And, um, and, and those are things that can be focused on directly uh, in order to help children um, uh, be able to act on the basis of their intelligence and, uh, and to be as motivated and engaged as, as they can be. Well, that's awesome. It, you know, it, it explains a lot that uh, whether you're a classroom teacher dealing with young children or like I was at one time where I coached soccer kids at very young mm-hmm. ages. And, you know, the difference between kids um, when you're teaching four-year-olds and five-year-olds is that, you know, some of the four-year-olds don't want to give up the ball once they get it. <laughs> and, right. And some of them uh, – um, they understand it sooner, the, the a little more of the concept of you know the the kicking and the passing and stuff like this. But one of the most the most amazing things that I learned about about kids at that age, because I was a high school teacher and a high school mm-hmm. um, coach and did different things like this. But then my own children brought me into the world of you know the, the younger children with this type of stuff, and it was mm-hmm. it, it's interesting listening to you because I, I think about some of the things that um, I was taught how to work with young kids by someone who had to have been a kindergarten teacher. Um, he taught us about the power of the blanket. And it was amazing because you worked with the kids to understand that when I talk with you, I need you to stop what you're doing and you come to the blanket. And so you would teach them that I'm at the edge of the, when I need to talk to you as a team, I come to the edge of the blanket, you come to the blanket, you stop what you're doing and sit on your ball or, or sit on the mm-hmm. blanket and, and then just take a look at me. And then, and then when I'm ready not to talk to you, I'll walk away from the blanket and you can go back out there and we'll, we'll do our stuff. And it's interesting because what I was as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, a, a kid who struggles with understanding those executive functions is not really going to understand except by watching the modeling of it from other mm-hmm. kids and uh, would explain like some of the, like, like a child who, uh, um, got the ball and kept going even past the goal, you know, just mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and the deaf father had well, to go get him. <laughs> that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, it, precisely. So um, it, it, there are a lot of, uh, I, I guess I would say a classic um, case of a failure of executive function skills is one where uh, children know perfectly well what they're supposed to do. Uh, but they they just can't do it. Um, and we see that in the context of things like the mouse, right? So um, you could say to, at, at three years of age, this is a typical phenomenon, um, but it, you can see it later in life and other situations too. You can say to a child, okay, we, we just sorted that card by shape and now we're going to switch and we're going to sort it by color. So now we put all the red ones here and all the blue ones there. And we say to the child, where do the red ones go? And they show you exactly correctly. What about this red one? Where does it go? And they'll turn around and sort it by shape because that's what they did before. And so it looks like, uh, you know, like they don't know what they're doing. Um, And it looks like um, maybe they're even being willfully disobedient or something. But it's just that these are relatively, you know, slow developing skills and, um, and adults, uh, can, can do similar sorts of things. You know, if you have a a habit you're trying to break, for example, you, you might know perfectly well what your goal is, what the, what the new rule you've set for yourself is and so forth. But that doesn't mean that you may not wake up and find yourself violating that rule. Um, and so it's really this this mismatch between what you know and your ability to behave in light of what you know. That's the gap that executive function skills fill. And and these skills, uh, it turns out, depend on on these networks in the brain that are among the most complex of brain networks. Uh, and, and the reason is because executive function skills are skills that we use to regulate other skills. 
So uh, we use them to uh, resist our temptation to reach for an extra piece of pie or something like that, right? And so we have these tendencies to reach, you know, we desire the pie and so forth, and we have to override that. Or um, we uh, use them to avoid being distracted or, <clears throat> um, or what have you. And so because these uh, skills involve the management of other skills and, and in the brain, the networks involve the coordination and regulation of all the other networks in the brain, they are extremely complex and they take quite a long time in order to uh, reach what we might think of as uh, a maturity. And so, in fact, on measures like the MEFs, um, what you see is that performance uh, improves dramatically during the preschool years. There's a big increase in children's executive function skills prior to kindergarten. Um, there's also a pretty big increase prior to the transition to middle school, right around puberty. Um, but these skills continue to improve until about age 25, typically. And that's when they reach the maximal healthy young adult level. And because these skills are so complex and they, they take so long to be acquired, um, that also means that they're particularly vulnerable to disruption due to stress and disease and, and aging more generally. And so neurologists uh, call these skills last in and first out. So they take a really long time to reach maturity in young adulthood, and then they are the most vulnerable to to disruption according to as a function of aging um, and so but that too just like in childhood is um, is avoidable so these are experience dependent skills and it's sort of like exercise right if you stop going to the gym your muscles are going to atrophy and you're going to get out of shape but if you continue to exercise these skills for example in a demanding career then you don't see that kind of age-related decline in in these skills. Excellent. I appreciate you explaining that. It is it is powerful, especially. I wish I had uh, wish I'd known this when I was working with the kids at the, at all those early ages. There, it's it's awesome stuff. All right, all right. So I got a I got a scenario for you. If you mm -hmm. had the chance to talk with an audience of teachers, I mean, in in my area of the of the country, we're Getting ready, many of the schools will be going back next week. The teachers will be back in the classroom by the end of the week and uh, the kids the following week. And, you know, it's uh, if you had a chance to talk with this audience of teachers right before, as they're getting ready to start school, what would you make mm -hmm. sure that they understood most about executive function skills as they prepare for this school year? I would uh, suggest that they uh, appreciate how fundamental they are all the things that teachers care about. They're fundamental to learning. Kids with better executive function skills get more out of a single lesson than kids with worse executive function skills. Uh, and <clears throat> they're more likely also to, um, to stay focused on um, the tasks at hand, uh, not to be distracted, um, and they're more likely to uh, regulate their behavior in, in the classroom, too. So it makes a teacher's job a lot easier. Uh, the second thing, so first of all, um, these are very fundamental skills. And everything else that uh, teachers are trying to do really depends on children having a, a sufficient level of these skills. Second, these skills themselves can be taught, and it's relatively easy to do so. One has to be mindful of those skills and sort of adopt a kind of executive function lens. Think about how executive function challenges, rather than just the difficulty of the lesson, might be uh, making it harder for children to, to do what you're asking them to do. And, uh, and so then a teacher can try to minimize the um, executive function demands, right? So rather than, for example, uh, give children a set of instructions and then talk about some other stuff and just assume that children, you know, remember those instructions. You can say, okay, remember, I'm going to go back over these instructions, you know, right, so that it's fresh in, in the child's mind. If that child might have difficulty, you know, reaching back and remembering uh, the relevant 
uh, information. Um, and so, so these skills are, are fundamental and they can be taught and teachers can, um, can, can teach them, uh, to children and, um, and, and help support their, their healthy development. In fact, it doesn't even need to be a separate, uh, set of lessons around executive function per se. Uh, it can be integrated into other kinds of activities. For example, um, Sometimes teachers may want to, uh, you know, have kids take a break and play some games. And there are lots of games that challenge executive function skills like Simon Says and Red Light, Green Light and so forth. And, and indeed, that's one of the ways that young children acquire these skills is by by playing those games that require you to resist temptation or, uh, you know, I spy or something like that. Right. Be very systematic and you know, attend selectively in your search for a particular uh, item in a book or something like that. So that's one thing. The other thing is these um, opportunities to provide, pr to help children practice their developing executive function skills can be integrated into um, math lessons and, and reading exercises and things like this. So some children, for example, if you're if you're doing addition problems and you do one addition problem and then another addition problem, and then you give them a subtraction problem, they will not subtract. They'll just add because that's what they did the first few times. And so one can uh, be m mindful and deliberate about building those things in so that children get practice stopping and saying, I got to look at the sign. Is it a plus sign or a minus sign? You know, and, um, and, and, and so, and, and another thing is that uh, when I say children learn these skills by doing uh, through practice, that means that they learn from their mistakes. So they have to have an opportunity to go in and, and display a, a failure of executive function where they act impulsively or they forget to keep information in mind. And then they can see that, oh, that's something I really have to pay attention to. And uh, and then children can uh, try harder to um, to, you know, engage their executive function skills moving forward. Excellent. I love it. Uh, yeah. uh, Phil, we're drawn to a close. If someone okay. wanted to follow up and connect with you and or learn more, where would you send them? I'd send them to reflectionsciences.com. dot uh, com. There's quite a bit of information on that website, resources, links to other resources. Uh, both for what is executive function, there's some videos on there, what is executive function, how do we recognize it, how do we measure it systematically and track progress over time, um, and then also what can we do to, uh, to support children in the acquisition of these fundamental skills. Excellent. I'll put uh, those links in my show notes so it's easy for the listeners to go there and click and link and and uh, hopefully reach out and talk with you about it. So good stuff. I, That'd be great. Thank I, you. You're welcome. And last two questions, which are qu questions sure. I like to ask my guests. And uh, um, the mm -hmm. first one goes like this. Um, so, Phil, how do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? Well, I, uh, I... I uh, really am committed to, um, at this point in my career, to leveraging the results of all of the scientific research that I've done to date. And I've been in this field for about 30 years or so. And, uh, and I, um, in the past decade or so, really came to the conclusion that um, we now know so much more about how to support children's healthy development than is put into practice in our school systems and and more broadly in our, our society that I uh, am passionately committed to ensuring um, that the practical implications of, of all that scientific research uh, get realized. Excellent. That's good stuff. And by the way, I've seen a lot of those articles um, that you've written and uh, that, that tells me that uh, you keep going. So I think I, I, yes. to do all that stuff. So good kudos there. Uh, you know, uh, last question. Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given a chance to say thank you? 
uh, I would say thank you for for recognizing my potential. Um, and uh, I've had a number of teachers, and uh, I, at at virtually every level of my education. Um, and so I hesitate to call out any particular one of them, but I would say what they have in common is uh, they reinforced my my sense of uh, agency and my sense of autonomy, my sense that I, if I tried hard, I could actually uh, learn something that would be valuable um, to me and to to society. And so I think it's I think it's important to um, to communicate to to students uh, the um, the high expectations that you that you might have of their at least of their potential in 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 practice and as an instructor myself I, I like to assume that every student is potentially a genius and I, you know I may be right I may be wrong but but working from that assumption I think gives them the best possible chance to succeed. So cool. Thanks for sharing it. Phil, thank you so much for sharing with us about reflective sciences and, and learning to measure a child's executive function skills. I mean, what an awesome discussion. So much to learn and understand, and you've helped me understand quite a bit today. Uh, wishing you the best in all you do. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcast by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.